Is it fine if I start? I'm still seeing people walking around, but I might as well start. All right, good. Um, so, I am, or well, my name is Kunait Westhuizen. I'm from the University of Cape Town. Um, and I'm going to take you through uh, some of the history that we've been through and some of the developments we're looking forward in doing. Oh. said name. Uh, so our history is that in the last two years um, we had quite extraordinary couple of events happen. Um, one being the roads must fall and then the fees must fall afterwards in starting in 2015 and then also reoccurring in 2016. Now these events kind of shook higher education in South Africa and um, changed how lecturers would approach a class, how they approach their students, the way they communicate, um, and like the challenges that they faced. Okay. So apart from that, we are currently running Sakai and Opencast. Um, on Sakai, we've got about six and a half thousand active concurrent users um, in the middle of the semester. That's about good. Uh, we've got 88 lecture venues um, equipped, and we're doing about 550 scheduled recordings on that. Um, and you can see that there's about 12. 12,000, 7,000, 12,700 <laughs> students that have used lecture recording in the last year. Now, even with the, um, the protests and basically the academic program coming to a halt and our exams being pushed out, all of that happening, our Sakai kept running 24-7. Um, students still had access to all their course materials. Our lecture recording still continued. We had lecturers showing up in empty venues um, just so that they can do their lectures and still publish that so that the students can have that for the whenever the exams would occur. So, and then we also upgraded in December and in February. So, in terms of infrastructure development, we grew. We were used throughout. But how we are used has changed. Okay. So lecturers now see things differently. And part of that is that face-to-face -face is not a given. It's not something you can depend on. Now, University of Cape Town is primarily a face-to-face -face kind of institution, but that's now changed. So how do you do that is you need a flexible learning approach. Um, you need to fill the gaps that might occur if a student doesn't actually attend the lecture or can't attend the lecture. Um, approaches like blended learning, flipping the classroom around, producing content in new ways um, to be accessible, to be timely in the way that you have it for the class before the class actually starts, but also in the sense that you use relevant information now in an African context, which you might have used the same content for the last five years, but now you can't. Because the students, you know, they did not appreciate that kind of approach. And that was part of the protest. Um, where did you get your content? Where, what's the transparency of where it comes from? And then the communication and relationship between students and lecturers. That's changed completely. Um, 
we had one group that sporadically just created WhatsApp groups just for communication instead of using the forums and stuff because the WhatsApp they can actually while they're in route can decide where the class will be so they would ad hoc just change a class and go there and continue their lectures which was very interesting okay so in our context is how would we use lecture videos because that's our focus to help with creating content and creating interactive content so that students can actually learn more right so the problem we have with video or lecture videos in general um, from a lecturer's perspective sorry is how do you create the content edit it store it and distribute it okay. um, you can create it it's on the next slide just with a PowerPoint where you can do your own recording from a webcam but then you still have to edit it in some way so you have to have an application or you upload it and use a web front end or something and then you need to store it somewhere but you don't have the original file and you need to distribute it to your students in some way so do you use YouTube but then YouTube is more public so some of the problems that we're approaching um, so we want lecturers to be able to create content without much training and effort they are the content experts in their field and you know, if they want to produce that content they don't need to learn something else maybe not related and then also be able to create store and distribute it securely okay so basically you can think of it in like four approaches bring your own device you do your own recording on your webcam or your own phone or whatever um, you can do a browser plugin now shown there is um, I think is a Firefox plugin that does a recording from your webcam stores the video and actually directly pushes it into open cost for processing on its own workflow um, I'll be talking about the one button studio and then online course development so as lecturers see that maybe what they want to do is they want to make this content more like video content but also online and openly available so let's talk about the one button studio so as a lecturer I would like to basically book the studio the venue go there and press a button do my recording be able to see my recording at some point and publish it to one of my course sites um, I don't need to know how the video gets there I don't need to know what the format is I just need to know that it's going to be on my course site okay so we start with Sakai and then we created this one button studio tool right? and you go to the tool in your Sakai so I mean a lecturer basically all their courses is in Sakai so they just log in and it's just a single click there's your schedule um, you can see what's scheduled for you what's available um, you can go to your recordings um, so you click on a, a button you fill in the details you upload a slide and then it's booked okay so now you can go back and change the booking you can um, change your presentation delete the booking whatever you want to do up to the point that it actually occurs so time goes by and eventually you show up at the venue now you walk into the venue and there's this nice screen that says the recorder is ready and you've got like 55 minutes to do your recording and all you do is you walk up to the nice blue button and you tap it and that's it that's how simple it is and then starts the presentation and then you start talking 
and doing things and then you stutter or something happens and you tap the button and it stops. That first video gets stored as take one. You tap the button again, take two starts recording. And you don't do that until your time runs out. So now, I've done this, and I walk back to my office. 20 minutes later, after lunch maybe, um, I get to the office and I decide, okay, I've got a notification that my video is now available, and I can go in and basically look at it, trim it a bit, and publish it. And decide, oh, it should go to my Mm. computer science course for the first years and there it goes simple as that so in the back you need to record the video in some way then we push that video into opencast um, opencast takes it and stores it in a nice secure archived way um, it does so with versioning, so you can go back and review, or if you, if you didn't like what you saw, you can remove it and all the things. Um, but for the lecturer, you kind of want to also talk back to your One Button Studio tool to display what they see. So there's your recordings. And each recording that goes into OpenCast gets processed in a specific way. Um, so we decide how a preview gets generated, and that's what the lecturer will see. The lecturer can then edit, review, publish it, delete it, do whatever they want with it. Um, OK, so this is just a short step. That's the video they see. And then they decide, oh, I don't like these bits. Okay. That, in the published workflow, gets trimmed into a shorter video. Um, you can add a, a nice splash screen on the, the front and a copyright bumper at the end. And then that final video is also stored on OpenCast. Also part of the whole visioning history of that video. And you can publish and review. Okay. So how would we do that in the fully online kind of course? Because a one-button studio in its, in its own is very good for a single lecturer, but if I want to do a complete course and I want to have it structured, I want to create outcomes, questions, all of that, how can I make that as simple as possible for the lecturer to do? So we created a, um, an online course manager. So this is like a, a MOOC manager in a sense. So from inception, where the lecturer says, I want to do this, and this is what I want to do, um, to learning design, where our department will help them go through the steps of adding content, deciding what they want to do, how they want to break it up, what are the outcomes for each individual step, um, video production, pre and post, um, where they would go out and shoot the video, create an uh, initial set of source videos which will go into OpenCast, which can be reviewed by the lecturer and by the production team, um, commented on, create annotations for that so that the production team can immediately see what's going on and the lecturer will be able to respond to that. Um, there's a review process and then the structure of the course and then quality assurance, outcome, peer review, all of that is all part of that whole thing where your entire video content is essentially in open cost, available to anyone that is managing this. Um, and then finally you can launch it and create marketing material because all your content's there. Okay. So the next bit is like interactivity because if you want your students to interact with lecture recording, just the plain old standard lecture recording, uh, you want your lecturers to be able to review and contribute to the production of their online course, then you would need some notation comments on the videos. Now, this is still in production, or not, sorry, 
not production. <laughs> this is still in development, uh, early stages of development. Um, but we're likely to see it within the next year. So the Paella player is um, it's a player that you can add on to OpenCast, but it provides so many cool features. <laughs> um, it's, it's got a very nice plugin system that you can just write a plugin and add to it. So if you want additional features, and it has multiple language caption support. Um, and if you want to know more about it, you can talk to Carlos over there. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the OpenCast comes with a, the default player. It's the Engage player. It also has a plugin system. Um, and we're also looking at maybe implementing some comments and annotations for that. OK. So the final structure we have is we have Sakai and OpenCast. Um, and we've got a player that basically gets the content from OpenCast and is able to display that in Sakai so a student can have their lecture videos or a lecturer can have or review their own lecture videos. Um, so the venues that we have are recorded and they're linked to OpenCast, pulls that in. I click too fast. Um, and then we're using Tugi to actually develop the One Button Studio tool to talk to the capture agent in the One Button Studio and feed that back into OpenCast. And we're using the same framework to create the online course manager. So, and initially, it'll be just to manage the production of online courses. But eventually, it might actually come to a point where we can have a front end for that, a public open one. OK. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> OK. That one. OK. Um, so the browser plugin, it runs in Firefox and Chrome. Um, you just, it's an LTI tool, essentially, that is in one of our branches. Um, and you launch it from Sakai, as you would any other LTI tool. And it's available. And then it basically just asks you permission to use your webcam. Okay. And then you can run it. Um, and the Firefox one, Duncan got it to actually also display PowerPoint slides <laughs> and do a picture-in-picture picture like you can see. Um, and then it records it into it like a temporary folder on your machine. And then at the end, it actually trans, well, well, it sends it to OpenCast as a specific kind of video. And then that gets processed. So it basically works like a browser based version of something like Camtasia. Like it will record your whole screen. Yes. OK. Yeah, you define what you want to capture. As long as you're using Firefox or Chrome. Yes. Because it needs that particular plugin, plugin to work yes. on it. Okay. Good. Cool. No one wants to see the code. <laughs> So, so you have these buttons in the classroom. Is that a literal? Um, are you talking about that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, the one button studio is um, it's a soundproof room with a set camera, um, and then that's just a USB button running from the capture agent to close to where the the lecturer would stand, and it's just basically like a USB mouse. It's a it's a very uh, expensive USB mouse, because all it is is you just click Start it. Start and stop and at the capture. Yeah. It just triggers the, the recording. So, so, sorry. 
So the button, it has a blue-red when it's recording, and when you push, it, the LED goes out, or the light goes out, or not? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So. I don't know. We were thinking of using the um, the Brix LED. It's a little light that goes into um, the capture agent. It gives you indication. So um, when you're scheduled, it'll it'll be like blue when there's no one. Um, it'll turn green when it's ready for recording. And when you tap the button, the button the light will go red while it's recording and then switch to green and so forth. Yeah. I don't actually know if this can change its color. <laughs> okay. Nothing. Cool. <laughs> Um, I wonder if you can see this. Oh, yeah. This is the, the program that will run in the One Button Studio. So it's essentially just a looping video with showing that the presentation's ready and queued up. Okay, cool. Thank you.